All right, welcome back to The Transfigured Life. I am excited to be met with Father Jonathan for this review of last week's discussion. How's it going, Father? It's going great, and I have really enjoyed reading a lot of the comments and chat that were associated with that discussion between Dr. Gavin Orton and Father uh, Stephen DeYoung. It was really fascinating to read that. Yeah, yeah, definitely a lot of a lot of good uh, comments and feedback. Uh, even some notable people resp uh, giving their thoughts on this discussion. But yeah, Father, we we definitely need to take a look at some of the stuff that were mentioned <laughs> in the. Uh, between the two, um, man, by the way, uh, I think it was great, grateful to have uh, both Father Stephen DeYoung as well as uh, doc Dr. Gavin on. Uh, definitely two very insightful uh, individuals, uh, very respected in both of their traditions. Um, so, Father, what were your initial thoughts of the debate, your overall thoughts as you were someone that was a live spectator in it? What did you think? I thought that I thought the discussion was fascinating because mm -hmm. um, uh, I know that that Dr. Gavin is always um, um, concerned that he's not getting a friendly reception among the Orthodox um, there, and and I think it was wonderful to have him and and Father Stephen in a in a dialogue between the two that really allowed for a lot of opinions and a lot of um, uh, respective teachings to come forward and so forth. Um, I am concerned that there are those in the reformist camp that okay. believe certain things about us. And we're going to try and address some of that tonight, because certainly, um, as Dr. Gavin said, you know, we're both searching for the truth and, and trying to be faithful and so forth. And yes, he is and we are. But there are some differences and we need to discuss those. We can't just excuse them and pretend like they don't exist or that we don't care about them or things like that. So that's what we're going to try and start to do tonight. Yeah, for sure. What did you and think? Uh, I'm sorry, you said. Well, what did you think? Yeah. Okay. So I thought I thought it was a great discussion. Um, it was uh, great to hear both points go back and forth. I thought so. Mind you, they were both very respectful. Uh, very. I, I think that the experience was enjoyable for both of them. Like I know, even afterwards, uh, Gavin shared his appreciation because I know he's. You know, sometimes like. Um, some sometimes people could get like not the best experience, you know, with you know our side, the the orthodox side, um, from what from what I've been told and what I've I've heard. So it seemed like he enjoyed his time with Father Stephen DeYoung. He even yeah. um, even you know kind of uh, when he shared the episode on his own channel, he said that as well. Like he had a good interaction with uh, Father Stephen DeYoung. Think it's something that maybe hopefully in the future they would you know have again. Um, whether with us or if they connect, but that would be great. Well, certainly um, a lot of the comments from our our, our fans uh, were asking for more. So we'll see if that uh, is something we can deliver on in the future. Yeah, yeah. A lot of the subs and and people that were tuning in from all sides was like, we need a part two. <laughs> so, right. so yeah, that that's cool. Hopefully, hopefully that could happen in the future. Um, but and I think it'd be good for those that are looking into orthodoxy to really discern both sides of the discussion, you know, um, sure, absolutely. and see what makes sense. Because I think as we do this review, uh, Father, uh, we're going to realize like with respect to that, Dr. Gavin, you know, I have a lot of respect for him, but he made, he was very confident, said some very bold claims that we can't let sweep under the rug. And I think, um, as let's, we let's review, examine those claims, shall we? Yeah. <laughs> so, so with this review, um, because, Father Stephen Young, for the most part, you know, we, you know, we would agree with, you know, with, with Father Stephen Young would say, you know, we're not going to spend too much time with what he had to say. Um, but let's uh, let's examine what Dr. Gavin had to say. Um, so, Father, um, let's start with Sola Scriptura. <laughs> okay, yeah, that, so, was, that was the that was the lead off uh, question we gave to him. Yeah, and his so, first comment uh, begins around the four minute mark, and let's take a look at that. Oops. There we go. All right, inferred from scripture, deduced from scripture. Many articulations of that doctrine are only speaking about what is necessary for salvation. There, there really isn't a, a mainstream historic Protestant view that says you have to have a chapter and verse for everything. So that's not Stop the target. The Another caricature is the idea that the Bible is the only authority. 
He as says, though we're it. just sort of general. Yeah, yeah. Let, let's pause it before we go on. Now, Dr. Gavin just made some statements that we have to examine before we go on. First of all, he said, the strongest articulations of the sufficiency of scripture. And by the way, anybody uh, that wants to go back and check the words that were said and so forth, there is a transcript that people can look at. And that's what I'm commenting on when, when we stop and I'm rereading what he said. Even the strongest articulations of the sufficiency of scripture allow for doctrines to be inferred from scripture, deduced from scripture. Inferred by who? Deduced by who? And how? This is the very thing that he criticizes the Orthodox for doing. Inferring from Scripture certain traditions, deducing from Scripture certain traditions, especially those that carried on after um, the apostles died. Then he goes on to say many articulations of that doctrine are only speaking about what is necessary for salvation. Again, according to who? So hmm. these kind of statements that are kind of thrown out a little bit casually, shall we say, really don't uh, give us any clear insights on how sola scriptura then forms the, 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 the Protestant mindset, the Calvinist reformed mindset, on how scripture then gives us this much, but then can't go beyond that, and, and holy tradition can't go beyond that either, and so forth. Uh, there's too much that just is left out there. There really isn't a mainstream Protestant view that says you have to have a chapter and verse for everything. That may be how he sees it, but that is not how a lot of people who say they believe in sola scriptura see it. So it has, if, if he's um, holding to a much uh, um, traditional Protestant view, reformed view of sola scriptura, that certainly isn't what a lot of people today understand sola scriptura to be. A classic example of teachings and doctrine changing from the time the reformers themselves first promulgated these particular things or, or held particular views. One can look at, for example, the fact that the early reformers all believed in the ever virginity of Mary, but their followers today don't. And they would cite sola scriptura as a reason for that. So um, yeah. this idea that there really isn't a mainstream Protestant view that says you have to have a chapter and verse for everything is a mainstream Protestant view against those that hold the Sola Scriptura. I want to, um, as, as kind of noting that, I, I want to bring up this particular quote, uh, which is from Ligonier Ministries' website. It says, but there are many important questions on which Scripture is silent. That's exactly what we say regarding Holy Tradition. Sola Scriptura makes no claim to the contrary. Imagine that. This is coming from R.C. Sproul's group. Nor does sola scriptura claim that everything Jesus or the apostles ever taught is preserved in scripture. Hallelujah. We say the same thing. Imagine. It only means that everything necessary, everything binding on our consciences, again, what's the list of that? And everything God requires of us, where's the list of that, is given to us in scripture. Again, a very subjective interpretation of what is given, what's required, things like that. But the idea that sola scriptura makes no claim um, to the uh, uh, to the things on which scripture is silent, uh, how the liturgy is to be done, how baptism is to be done, uh, how the Lord's Supper is to be done and things like that. Uh, scripture really doesn't talk about any of that. Um, and then here is that 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 quote, nor does sola scriptura claim that everything Jesus or the apostles ever taught is preserved in scripture. This is what we've been saying in the discussion about sola scriptura for a long time. Okay, let, let, let's continue rolling from that point, because there's something else he's going to say in just a few seconds, and we want to talk about that. Okay, continue on that. All right. All of those things are tremendously valuable. Sola Scriptura simply means they're fallible. So the intention of Sola Scriptura is not a rejection of the church, not a rejection of tradition, but a measuring of them by the superior standard of scripture. Francis Turretin, the reformed theologian, talks a lot about this. He basically says the, the issue of sola scriptura does not have to do with whether there is any judgment that belongs to the church in controversies of faith. It's about what is that supreme North Star by which everything else must 
be adjudicated. So that, so that's what Sola Scriptura is, is the scripture is the only infallible rule for the church. In other words, after the apostles die, okay, the, the period of public divine revelation is over. There do not persist ongoing mechanisms of infallibility in the church. Infallibility okay, meaning there. being preserved from error in some way. Okay. Now, here, here's the problem with that claim. Um, the, the, he, he quotes Francis Turretin, and, and the quote is, after the apostles die, the period of public divine revelation is over. Again, how do you know that? Mm. There do not persist ongoing mechanisms of infallibility in the church. Well, if that's the case, we have a problem. Let's take a look at why that might be. Here's what the scriptures say. However, when he, the spirit of truth, has come, he will guide you into all truth. For he will not speak on his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak and he will tell you things to come. Now, if that's not the mechanism by which truth is preached and taught from generation to generation within the church, within the body of Christ, then you have a problem claiming what you just claimed. I don't care who Francis Turretin is or what he said. The fact of the matter, if he's saying something and you're quoting him and it goes against this, then we have a problem with authority in the church and where it comes from. And we have to be very careful when we are um, looking at this kind of thing because that transmission of faith is something that is given to us by the apostles themselves. Timothy was told by St. Paul, guard what was committed to your trust. Not He didn't say this to a church. He said it to a bishop. He said it to one on whom he had laid hands on by his own admission that he had laid hands on giving him some apostolic authority to guide the flock that had been entrusted to his care. That's in 1 Timothy 6.1. In 2 Timothy 2, we have, and the things that you have heard from me, Timothy, among many witnesses, commit these to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. That's the guarantor of the transmission of the apostolic deposit of faith. Great. One bishop, teaching the next generation of bishops faithfully so that they receive in full and in toto what the bishop, what the ap apostle has taught them and faithfully then passing that on. That's the very explanation of paradosis, of traditio. Mm. Both infer very plainly um, the transmission or the handing down of something from one person to the next. Faithfully yeah. received, faithfully passed on. So when we go back to to listen to the quote that that Dr. Gavin brought up, uh, according to Francis Turret in Sola Scriptura, uh, is the scripture is the only infallible rule of the church. In other words, after the apostles die, the period of public divine revelation is over. According to who? Because according to the scriptures, that's not what was happening at that time. Great. And clearly, when you move beyond the scriptures to the apostolic fathers in the post apostolic period, Clement, Ignatius, Irenaeus, they were all talking about how they received authority from the apostles and how they are now the new generation of apostles carrying the church forward from generation to generation. So Turretin is just playing wrong here. And for Dr. Gavin to quote him, when the scriptures clearly give us a very different impression yeah. of that transmission of truth from one generation to the next, guaranteed by the Holy Spirit who will lead us into all truth, you can't say, you cannot say that the period of the public divine re revelation is over. You just can't say it. It's, 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 it's contrary to what scripture itself is saying. Mm. Well said, Father. Well said. Well, on that note, um, I know that uh, he mentioned, we, we asked the question if Sola Scriptor is of divine inspiration or practical necessity and i was very pleased to hear his answer to this question because essentially from my vantage point it seems like he's admitting that sola scriptura is a tradition right and if it's a tradition then and if it's not actually of divine inspiration then why should you not be skeptical of that? Why should we hold to it? <laughs> you know what I mean? I understand exactly. he, he sees yeah. it as, yeah, he sees it as a means to 
I guess, be faithful to, uh, you know, to scripture or to what they received. But still, it's still a tradition of men, which I feel like cuts his point of what he was saying, uh, er, you know, before about the whole Pharisees and they were using traditions to bind men and things like that. It's like, well, Protestants have created their own tradition in the 16th century. And just because you feel like there's good means for it, because you feel like it'll safeguard you. And Father Stephen DeYoung, I believe, even kind of granted like, hey, you know, I, you know, almost like he understood the need for it. Right. He said, I, I get it with the Roman with the times with the Roman Catholic Church. I understand why something like that would come up. He says something to that effect. But still, you know, if it's a tradition of men, why hold to it? So um, I don't know if you quickly want uh, me to go to that part. I think it was at the 15. Yeah, we're going to go to the 15 minute, 28 second mark, because that's when Dr. Gavin was asked whether Sola Scriptura is of divine inspiration or practical necessity. And there's something here that we have to point out that that's really rather important. So let me know when you're ready. All right, cool. I'll add it right now. So, so I, I would say it's not itself of divine inspiration. It's the effort to be faithful to that which is of divine inspiration. And to that extent, it is a practical necessity because basically uh, we need to be guarded against errors that can creep in among the people of God. Uh, and and Wait a minute. in these differences... Now, the problem we have are, here is... Okay, he's he's admitting sola scriptura is of divine inspiration. I don't I don't think I've ever spoken to anybody that, that has said anything to the contrary. But he no, said that it's, it's not of divine faithful inspiration. To that which is of divine inspiration, and to mm -hmm. the extent it is a practical necessity, because basically we need to be guarded against errors that can creep in among the people of God. First question is: so if it's not divine, how do you know your effort mm. is being faithful? Number one. <sighs> Come on. And if your effort is an attempt at being faithful at what you understand divine inspiration to be, how is that any different from holy tradition? <laughs> mm, well, well, um, I love this quote by St. Vincent of Lorenz uh, gives you kind of the mindset of the church around the fifth century. Um, you're probably very familiar with it. So he says, I have often then inquired earnestly and attentively of very many men eminent for sanctity and learning. And how by what sure, oops, my phone closed on me, by what sure and so to speak universal rule, I may be able to distinguish the truth of the Catholic faith from falsehood of heretical pravity. And I have always in, in almost every instance received an answer to this effect that whether I or anyone else should wish to detect the fraud and avoid the snares of heretics, as they arise and to continue sound and complete in the Catholic faith, we must, the Lord helping, fortify our own beliefs in two ways. First, by the authority of the divine law and then by the tradition of the Catholic church. And then he goes, uh, he goes to talk about uh, some other groups that have their, uh, their own beliefs and holdings and how they're problematic. But then he, he also says, but here are some perhaps but here some perhaps will ask, since the canon of scripture is complete and sufficient of itself for everything and more than sufficient, what need is there to join with it the authority of the church's interpretation? For this reason, because own, owing to the depths of Holy Scripture, all do not accept it in one in the same sense, but one understands it in its words in one way and another in another, so that it seems to be capable of as many interpretations as the interpreters. Then he talks about that list I told you about. Yep. He yep. says, therefore, it is very necessary on account of such great intricacies to uh, uh, such uh, intricacies of such various errors that the rule for the right understanding of the prophets and the apostles should be framed in accordance with the standards of ecclesial and Catholic interpretation. Father, I could keep reading on, but I, I know that. He's great. It's, it's fun to read his commentaries. He's a good guy. Mm, yeah. So essentially, he's he's saying we ought to hold to the interpretation of the church, right? And what has been believed uh, later, if I continue on to read, is basically what has been believed always by all, you know, not and necessarily. Everywhere. And everywhere. Yeah, everywhere. Yep. 
and by all, which is the same case that the the Orthodox Church would make, right. you know, even from our understanding of economic councils to what we are teaching, how we preserve holy tradition. This is what our church has said. And you can go on and read so many fathers. Matter of fact, there was a, a point in time where I think it was, I don't know if it was uh, Dr. Gavin who mentioned that St. Augustine believes in Sola Scriptura. And it's just wild because from St. Augustine to St. Basil to so many fathers, contrary to popular belief, are not saying anything remotely that says Sola Scriptura is the mind of the church, right? So St. Basil, he's made comments that, you know, tradition and as well as uh, scripture is of the same force, right? He says this in On the Holy Scripture, you know, also... St. Augustine, if I could read a quick quote from him, Father, because I know sometimes Go ahead. Yeah. people try to pluck St. Augustine. All right. So he says, but in regards to those observance, which, which we carefully attend and which the whole world keeps in which we derive not from scripture, but tradition, we are given to understand that they are recommended and ordained to be kept either by the apostles themselves or by economical councils, the authority, which is quite vital in the church. So Augustine himself understood like there was scripture and tradition. This is why he would do something like praying to the saints, which Dr. Gavin would take issue with. You know what I mean? Um, but he's not going to bring that point up when he's talking about St. Augustine. He's not going to bring up some of the, you know, uh, or Pado communion. He's not going to bring that, that part up. You yeah. know what I mean? So, um, I said well, enough, we, we need to we need to talk about those inconsistencies because th th this is what's fueling a lot of people's confusion and those that are making the the the, the they're looking at orthodoxy hear the counter arguments and go oh that that that's that sounds reasonable they're not reasonable they're actually contradictory let right. let's pick up with something that was said in in the discussion at the 16 minutes 17 second mark 16 minutes and 17 seconds. It follows on the quote. You could probably just hit play, and we'll, we'll, we're, we might be right there anyway. Okay. Errors in the church. Sometimes I get the impression people are thinking, n none of you in the, in the comments and other places, that people think the church is either perfect or dead. Uh, but the church can be alive, and I would agree wholeheartedly with, the, with uh, what I take to be the definition of tradition that Father Stephen mentioned of the Holy Spirit's life in the church. We believe as Protestants, the Holy Spirit has never abandoned the church. The church never died. The Holy Spirit never forsook the church, but the church can be alive even while there are errors. I, I think that's an extreme. Let, 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 let's hold that right there, because if, if there's something being said here that that's contradictory, th this might actually be it. Let, let's take a look at what he said earlier and what he just said. Now, um, it, it, when at, earlier at, at the four minute, 41 second mark, he mentioned Francis Turretin and I spelled Turretin wrong, forgive me. <clears throat> but what he said was, what Dr. Gavin said was, social, uh, uh, sola scriptura is the only infallible rule for the church. In other words, after the apostles die, the period of public divine revelation is over. There do not persist ongoing mechanisms of infallibility in the church. Uh, I didn't say, Dr. Gavin didn't say this, he's quoting Francis Turretin. Mm -hmm. um, mechanisms of infallibility in church infallibility meaning being preserved from error in some way now you have that statement which he's quoting turretin as saying then compared with what he just said we believe as protestants the holy spirit has never abandoned the church the church never died the holy spirit never forsook the church how can you say then how can you quote turretin saying that after the apostles died the period of public divine revelation is over no it's not not if you admit the church never died, the Holy Spirit never abandoned the church and, and never forsook the church and so forth. Of course, Christ said, I, you know, that that would not happen. These are contradictory statements. You can't have it both ways when you're arguing against the Orthodox and our holy tradition to say that one is the case and then later on say, well, but we believe this. Because clearly this is a contradiction to say one and then to say the other. So this is the problem with Calvinist Reformed theology is that there are contradictions there 
And it seems to me um, that, that some of these contradictions are there simply because they want to be different from us. And if we say, A, they have to be, say, if we say the sky is blue, they're going to have to say it's red <laughs> because they can't be like us because to acknowledge that we have been faithful since the time of Pentecost and continue to promulgate and propagate and continue on the traditions and the teachings from that time, they're in a big bind. And that's a big problem for them. They don't know what to do with it. So they have to be different from us. Mm. No, no, I, I get where you're coming from, Father. I wonder if the, I guess the case that will be made from the other side is that, um, no, this, the spirit is still active in the church, but it just happened to the public revelation would end. Cause I, I could just, I'm just trying to wonder what that side would say. Um, but see, if the spirit is still active, how can public revelation end? Yeah. How do you show me where that's the case, how you know that to be the case? They can't point to anything well, historical or otherwise that proves their point. Well, that, that's a good point. I think on the historical side, they won't they 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 can't really demonstrate that. It's just a it's just an assertion. Um, speaking of assertion, there was a lot of assertions made, a lot of a lot of uh, bold claims, right? Like I know I mentioned like there was a lot of attacks on Nicaea too. Uh, there was even comments about the anathemas, they even comment, the whole telephone game thing. I don't know if you remember. Well, that, that the, was kind of quite frankly, that was a, a careless and, and uh, um, flippant remark that was made. Because, again, if we go back to these quotes right here, um, if we go back to these quotes right here, if you... If, and, See, in the first one, he's quoting Turretin, but in the second one, this is his statement. Right. So if you believe as Protestants, the Holy Spirit has never <laughs> abandoned the church. The church never died. So secessionism, just, uh, secessionism, secessionism uh, doesn't exist. Okay. <laughs> uh, the Holy Spirit never forsook the church. If you believe that, then you can't say the transmission of teaching and dogma and doctrine was uh, subject to the telephone game. <laughs> because not, first the, the 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 scriptures by the time the the second generation and third generation of apostles had come along the post apostolic period the apostolic fathers by the time they came along there there was a new testament corpus it was a little fluid uh, some books were in it according to some that were not in the, the canon of others but pretty much the the four gospels and the epistles of paul and so forth pretty much that was was known was <laughs> was quoted from and so forth so there already was a apostolic witness uh that they had in addition to the oral teaching that had passed down from generation to from bishop to bishop to bishop from generation to generation there already was that confirm one confirmed by the other the oral confirmed by the written and vice versa and as time went by whether you went to gaul italy spain you know iberia Greece, the Middle East, or whatever, everybody was teaching the same thing. Now, that is really hard to do. That's not a telephone game at that point. And when you see mm. that the consistency of teaching is, is, is exactly that, consistent from place to place to place to place, from generation to generation, the first hundreds of years of Christianity, you can't explain that away or say that somehow that's a telephone game. That's not a telephone game. If there was a telephone game, then you got to prove it by coming up with the bishops that did teach something different. And when they did, the others went, rose up and said, no, that's not what we were taught. That's not what John said or Mark said or Peter said or whoever said. Right. And, we and, know and that's just not what they taught. Yeah. Yeah. Well, well said father. And uh, yeah, yeah. I think, uh, <laughs> I know he mentioned anathemas as well. I don't know if you <laughs> you want to say a comment about that. I mean, he I, I do actually. I, I very okay. much do because because Dr. Gavin, if there's something he keeps going back to, even if we're not on the on the subject, he keeps going back to Nicaea too. And mm -hmm. and I don't want to say he seems obsessed with it, but he does seem obsessed with it. And I think part of his issue is he has taken personally the anathemas that were issued by that council, and he feels that they are directed at, at him and, and people like him. This is what he has said. He's very clearly said this. And anybody that is that listened to this <coughs> discussion between him and, and Father Stephen or heard him speak otherwise about icon veneration 
uh, one of the accretions to the faith, uh, knows that he has brought this up repeatedly. But I want to I want to bring up um, uh, something that's going to explain what an anathema is, and I want our <coughs> our viewers to be very clear about this because we have written about this, and and this particular uh, explanation of anathema is from just the last century. But I came across the same kind of stuff from Saint Theophon the Recluse and others. And I picked St. John's explanation here because it's one of the most concise that can be given. Uh, if, if, if we can um, encourage Dr. Gavin and those like him to set aside their concern regarding the anathas being personally hurled at them, something like this could hopefully go a little bit of the way towards that. What St. John says is in the Acts of the Councils, the word anathema came to mean complete separation from the church, a complete tearing away from the church. In other words, you were in the church and you've been anathematized because you're teaching something that places you now outside the church. You were in it. Now you're outside it because of your, your teaching. Now, penance is mm -hmm. laid upon a person. I'm paraphrasing something St. John said here. I didn't have the room to put it in. Penitence laid upon a person would still mean he is a member of the church, even though limited. Grace would be limited to him. But nevertheless, those given over to anathema <coughs> were thus completely torn away from her until their repentance. Anathema is not final damnation, Dr. Gavin. Please pay attention. Until death, repentance is possible. Anathema is fearsome, not because the church wishes evil or God seeks their damnation. Nope. But because they... God and the church desire that all will be saved. So again, an anathema is something that is pronounced on someone who is in the Orthodox Church, teaching and proclaiming something that we don't teach and proclaim. In fact, they're teaching and proclaiming the exact opposite. And the the iconoclast, iconodual civil war of the eighth and half of the ninth century uh, would be a, a, a perfect example of that. So the anathemas declared that those in the Orthodox Church teaching thus and so, the iconoclast controversy, could not be Orthodox if they continued teaching that, and therefore they were placing themselves outside the boundaries of the Church. This has nothing to do with Protestants or Calvinists or Roman Catholics, or I mean, they, they adopted Nicaea too, so I really shouldn't include them. But anybody in the Protestant world, this does not apply to you. And let's also remember when uh, Dr. Gavin and others um, talk about icon veneration being an accretion, that the Oriental Orthodox, the Assyrian Church of the East, and many other groups that, that kind of tore away from us in the um, fifth and sixth century and things like that, they were already venerating icons and had them in their churches way before Nicaea II and the seventh and eighth century came along. So this yeah. is not something that was an accretion. This is something that was already in the church at the time. So again, one more time, Dr. Gavin, anathemas are not being hurled at you. They are not personally directed to you or anyone like you because you are not in the Orthodox Church. So to say yeah. that I feel uh, offended, um, and you've said words to these extent, uh, to say that you feel offended by the fact that the church has made these pronouncements means you're concerning yourself about something about which you do not have to be concerned. And it's as simple as that. Yeah. Yeah. And then to, to piggyback off you, I, you know, uh, he's taking the most extreme interpretation of the, the anathemas and, um, and is almost deciding like, no, you guys are, are almost gaslighting me or something like that. Like how, how can you, how can you insert that about someone else's faith? Um, it's just it's just rather interesting. I mean, you look at, uh, you know, I believe it's a uh, Corinthians seven and, um, you know, pretty much the guy that was in, in some kind of sexual sin, like he was taken out of the church in hopes of repentance, you know. Right. Um, right. So the same spirit is the, the spirit of understanding is the same with the Orthodox Church in, in regards to how we understand anathemas. And um, I even talked to Father Stephen Young on this point and. He he pretty much uh, shared the 
you know, that's what that's what he was. He wanted to share that. But the the time didn't uh, get to we didn't get to get there because a lot of it was on uh, Nicaea. But um, but no, that by point, the way, let, let, one one more thing about the anathemas is that uh, I've heard Dr. Gavin say that. Well, but it says they're directed at everyone. Well, no, 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 no. Back then, there was only the one Holy Catholic and Apostolic Church. There, there was no other church. There was no Protestant church. There was no even d divide between East and West. There was one church. There were no others at that point. The anathemas could not have been directed at anybody outside the church because there wasn't anybody outside the church at that time other than the iconoclasts. Because even the Oriental Orthodox and the Assyrian Church of the East, for example, even them, they, that, that family of churches, even they did not get involved in the iconoclast controversy. They were iconoduals. So yeah. these, th that civil war and that debate really didn't touch them. So this is not even directed at them. Yeah. Because the split between them and us really was very fluid for like 100, 200 years before everything finally kind of fell out the way it did. So yeah. we, we have to make it, this very clear. We're not condemning everybody and we're not condemning them for all eternity and so forth. As St. As, as John Maximovich uh, said, and again, I want to uh, encourage people to read Anathema and its meaning. You can look this up on the Internet. That's where I found it. It was fairly easy. And this is what he said. So this is really what um, what the church believed. The word anathema came to mean complete separation from the church. So you were already in it. Now you've been separated from it by your teaching, by your, yeah. your opinions, by your heresy. Right. Yeah. Okay. And uh, I would say that if anything is an accretion, <laughs> Sola Scriptura is an accretion. I mean, like. Let's be let's be for real now. It's not it's not found uh, pretty much in the mind of the church. There's so much tradition that you could point to that would easily refute this case, right? Um, so if anything, sola scriptura is a, 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 an accretion. I can guarantee you, and we talked about this when we had a, a debate like a while ago, Father. There, one of the notes that I put down is. You you would not find anyone practicing sola scriptura in the first, second, third century. Like, like I would put that out there. If, if we're gonna be all, you know, hey, there's there's no icon veneration within the first five centuries. I put the same claim out there. Protestant, show me uh sola scriptura practice within the first few centuries of the church. Yeah, and, I, and they're really they they can you claim they even it here or there, but it's just not there. Right. It's not not only is it not there, like practically because of the understanding of the canon and how it was compiled, you couldn't even, even if you wanted to practice Sola Scriptura, you couldn't functionally do it like you couldn't actually do it if you wanted to. So it's just it's just wild. That issue, the plethora of interpretations, I, I understand the counter argument to that. Hey, this does not Sola Scriptura does not safeguard one to having the clear understanding. But there's just so many any any protestant is being honest uh, honest truth seeker would see that it's just a self-refuting uh, uh you know claim you know so father um but no we we appreciate our obviously we appreciate our protestant friends and we, we do. do ask them to you know look at these things with an open mind um and uh yeah we'll kind of leave it at at that uh in the future though we do have somebody that is very well studied in some of that evidence uh, for icon veneration within the first few centuries that we'll get on the Transfigured Life soon to talk about some of that stuff. Which, Father, I think it's interesting that if a lot of this comes down to evidence, because that's that is it, because Father Stephen Young was making theological arguments, theological points. And ironically, the Protestant was making so more so of, hey, well, where's the evidence for this? Where's yeah. the evidence for I want to see this. So we'll bring that. But the question is, if you do have the evidence, does that mean you now have to change your whole view and accept orthodoxy? Hmm, like, how does that I work? I wonder. Hmm. <laughs> so, um, well, Father, thank you for your thoughts. Um, Luther, thank you for yours. Yeah, for sure. For sure. Guys, thank you for tuning in to the Transfigured Life. We will be back in two weeks. We will God indeed. <laughs> All right. Well, Father, you have a great evening. You too, Luther. Take care, everybody. Thank you for tuning in.